So as we continue this morning in our series about cultivating a table culture, we will be moving to the third account of Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper, which is found in Matthew chapter 26. I've mentioned this before, but when Matthew composed his gospel, he used the gospel of Mark as a source. So most of what we find in Matthew is verbatim what we find in Mark, but there are a couple of noticeable and significant differences in Matthew's account. Matthew's account begins like this. He says that while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for your many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The first difference that I want to point out if you were comparing Matthew's account to Mark's account is that when, after taking the cup, Jesus instructs his disciples to drink from it. And then in verse 28, he says that this cup is his blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you read all the accounts of the Lord's Supper, Matthew's is the only one that has Jesus saying that his blood which is seen in the cup of the Lord's Supper, is effective at forgiving sins. The second thing that I want to point out is after Jesus says this, there in verse 29 he tells the disciples that he will not drink the cup again until he does so new in my Father's kingdom. The other Gospels have Jesus saying that he will not drink the cup again until he does in the kingdom of God. Matthew here changes God to Father, which is something that Matthew does often throughout God. Matthew seems to have an affinity for this language of God as Father, not merely Jesus' Father, but also the Father of all of those who follow after Jesus. You see, the reason that Matthew adds this phrase, the forgiveness of sins, and why he speaks of Jesus' Father's kingdom is because in Matthew's gospel, one of the key emphases is the kingdom of God. Now, Matthew prefers the term the kingdom of heaven. And in Greek, that term heaven is plural. So literally, it would read the kingdom of the heavens. Heaven being the place where God is, as opposed to earth being the place that we, human beings, live. And so when God, when Matthew rather uses this phrase, the kingdom of the heaven, really just a synonym for the kingdom of God, because the heavens is where God lives. More specifically, I think Matthew might have in mind that the kingdom of the heavens is a kingdom that is characterized by the heavens. It is a kingdom that looks like the place where God lives. And this language of the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of God refers to God's rule and reign. Now in times past, particularly in churches of Christ, we have equated the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven with the church. We've said the church is the kingdom of heaven. The church is not the kingdom of heaven. The church is a part of the kingdom of heaven because the church is under the rule and reign of God. But the language of kingdom of heaven is much larger and more expansive than merely church. For the Gospels to talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven coming to earth is to say that God's rule and reign are coming to earth. 
It is for God to defeat the powers of evil that control His creation. It is for God to turn the earth into a place that is reminiscent of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is for God to bring heaven and earth together, creating a new heaven and a new earth. It is to make God's creation His dwelling place once again. And when Jesus comes on the scene and begins to preach, He says that this kingdom, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That God's rule and reign are coming. The question is, what will this kingdom look like? How are the citizens of this kingdom meant to live? How will God rule and reign over His creation? And Jesus' teaching throughout Matthew's Gospel answers those questions. One of the primary things Jesus is in the Gospel of Matthew is Jesus is a teacher. There are five major teaching sections use gospel that mirror the five books of Torah or the five books of the Hebrew law. And in these teaching sections, Jesus teaches about the nature of the kingdom of the heavens. And in Matthew, an important characteristic of this kingdom is that it is a kingdom that provides for the forgiveness of sins. Which is why Matthew inserts this phrase into his account of Jesus' Last Supper, an institution of the Lord's Supper. This kingdom provides forgiveness of sin. Now, sin means something like to miss the mark. That would be a little definition of the word for sin. Speaking in a religious context, sin refers to when a person does something or lives in a way that is contrary to the expectations or the laws of God. And God's expectations and laws are and always have been rooted in the creation. That is, the way that God created and designed human beings and the rest of the creation to live and operate. A prime example of this would be the Sabbath, which we discussed the last several weeks in our adult Bible class. Israel is commanded to follow the Sabbath. One of their laws is to follow the Sabbath. The fourth commandment, honor the Sabbath. The reason that Israel is to honor the Sabbath is because of God. They are to rest on the seventh day just as God rested on the seventh day of creation. God's laws and expectations have and always have been rooted in the creation. And so this means that for a person to sin is for them to do something or to live in a way that is contrary to how God created and designed human beings to live and operate. And when this happens, when we sin, when we live in a way that is contrary to how God created and designed human beings to live and operate, there are consequences. Now, this, I think, is a very crucial point. The consequences of sin are not primarily from God. The consequences of sin are not because God enjoys seeing bad things happen to people. The consequences of sin are because of sin. Sin produces the consequences of sin. Now sometimes the consequences that sin produces happen now. So generally, when someone lives a bad life, eventually their bad decisions catch up with them. It's not always the case, but generally, that's kind of the rule of the way the world operates. But there are other consequences of sin that happen Now, so uh, let's think about cheating. Cheat on a test, you fail the test. There's a consequence now. You cheat on your spouse, you ruin that relationship. There's a consequence now. Death that happens now is a consequence of sin. Sin produces consequences. Now, the consequences of sin 
don't always happen now, but sometimes they happen in the future. And that's where God comes in when we think about God causing consequence for sin. You see, eventually when Jesus returns and God creates a new heaven and a new earth and God fully establishes the kingdom of the heavens, in order to do so, God will conquer the kingdom of sin and evil that is currently controlling the creation. Now, when we live in sin, we live in sin, we become a part of the kingdom of sin or the kingdom of evil. Now, when somebody becomes a citizen of the kingdom of sin, it is contrary to their will. You notice that the New Testament talks about being a slave to sin. We become slaves in the kingdom of sin. When someone becomes a slave, you generally don't become a slave willingly. You're drawn into slavery. So when we live a life of sin, we are drawn in as a slave in the kingdom of sin. And those who are a part of the kingdom of sin and evil go down with the kingdom when God destroys it. Not because of God directly, but because of sin and evil desire to bring down as many people with it as it can. When the kingdom of sin and evil goes down, it doesn't go down quietly. Sin produces consequences. And so the concept in Matthew of being forgiven of sin is that our sins are wiped away. They are no more. Our record has been cleared. To have sins forgiven means that we have been set free from the kingdom of sin and evil to become a free citizen in the kingdom of God. And so think about that. If there is no more sin, if sin is wiped away, if we are no longer a slave in the kingdom of sin, then there's no more consequence for sin. Now that doesn't mean that we don't still sin. That you and I, as citizens of the kingdom of It doesn't mean that we never miss the mark. And when we do so, it doesn't mean that there are still going to be some consequences now. Right? You cheat on a test. You cheat on your spouse. There's still going to be consequences now. But the hope as citizens of the kingdom of the heavens is that the Spirit is at work within us to transform us into people who not only no longer do those things, but no longer even desire to do them. I also believe that when we think about sin being wiped away, we have to understand that as citizens in the kingdom of the heavens, that citizenship, I firmly believe, provides us with the best life we can possibly live now. But specifically when Matthew speaks about removing the consequences from sin as sin is forgiven, he's thinking about the ultimate removal of the consequences of sin that is found in our hope. Our hope of resurrection where death is no more. Our hope of new creation where the kingdom of sin and evil has been destroyed once and for all. And this forgiveness of sin is brought about through the kingdom of the heavens that Jesus came and established. Before Jesus was born, An angel comes to Joseph and says this, speaking of Mary, She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus comes from the Hebrew word Yeshua, or Joshua, which means salvation, deliverance, or help. Jesus came to establish a kingdom that saves or delivers or helps people from their sins. And this forgiveness that characterizes the kingdom of the heavens is a forgiveness because of and rooted in the work, ministry, and life of Jesus. So Matthew will tell us stories like this. And just then, some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. 
Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human I think this scene here in Matthew 9 is the perfect image of what the kingdom of heaven is all about. The kingdom that Jesus came to earth to bring saves us, as it does this paralyzed man, from society's outskirts by giving us a kingdom to belong to. The kingdom of the heaven saves us from the limitations and diseases that inflict our bodies because it gives us the hope of resurrection. But perhaps most importantly, the kingdom of the heaven saves us from our sins because the king of this kingdom, the son of man, Jesus, has the power to forgive sins. And because of this, when Jesus teaches about the kingdom in Matthew, particularly when he teaches about the kingdom in the famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus can say that we as citizens the kingdom should pray this and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors because as Jesus goes on to say a couple of verses later for you forgive others their trespasses your heavenly father there's the father language again will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others neither will your father forgive your trespasses The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom that is characterized by forgiveness. This is why you and I could have the confidence to pray, forgive our debts. This is not a prayer where we beg God to forgive us and God might or might not oblige and forgive, but it is a prayer of confidence knowing that God can and does forgive and that God has even forgiven us before we ever utter the words. However, this forgiveness that characterizes the kingdom of the heavens is not merely God's forgiveness of us, but it is also our forgiveness of one another. Think about this. If the kingdom of God is going to be characterized by forgiveness that everyone who makes up the kingdom, not just God, but everyone who makes up the kingdom, you and I must model forgiveness. You'll notice there in this last verse that Jesus even goes so far as to say that if we don't model such forgiveness, then we will not be forgiven. Now if this is true, which we're assuming it is, right? If this is true, that the kingdom of God is characterized by forgiveness, not merely God's forgiveness of us, but our forgiveness of one another, this leads to a very important question. And leave it to no one other than Peter to ask the very important question. Matthew chapter 18. Peter comes to Jesus and says, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. If we forgive one another, Oh, well, when does that end? How many times should we forgive? And this is how Jesus answers. Not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this, the kingdom of heaven, this kingdom characterized by forgiveness, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Uh, 10,000 talents, I don't remember off the, the top of my head how much it is. Uh, it's more than anybody could ever expect to pay back in their lifetime or their great, 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 great grandchildren's lifetimes. 
No way that this man could ever pay it back. And so, verse 25, he could not pay. His Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions and payment to be made. Still wouldn't have been enough to pay the debt. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, much, much less, a reasonable debt that could be paid. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Do not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You see, our forgiveness for each other is rooted in the forgiveness that we have received from God. We forgive each other because God has forgiven us. More than that, I think this parable illustrates that we forgive each other to the same degree that God has forgiven us. God has forgiven us a debt that we could never pay. So we forgive minor debts between one another. And so with this in mind, as we circle back to the Lord's Supper, Matthew would have us think about the kingdom. The kingdom of the heavens, where God's rule and reign comes to earth, transforming God's creation into a place that is reminiscent of heaven. Transforming the creation once again into God's dwelling place. The kingdom of the heavens that was brought to earth in Jesus. Jesus ascended to the throne. He established God's rule and reign, conquering the kingdom of sin and evil through His death and resurrection. And so as we take the bread and the Lord's Supper, which represents Jesus' body, as we take of the cup which represents Jesus' blood, we remember that it was this body and blood that established the kingdom of the heavens. But most importantly for Matthew, I think, we remember that this kingdom is a kingdom that provides the forgiveness of sins. We remember that it was Jesus' body and blood and resurrection that provides us that forgiveness and frees us from the power of sin. But the Lord's Supper is also a moment, Matthew believes, for us to be convicted. Jesus teaches in Matthew that forgiveness is found in Him, in the kingdom of the heavens, but that we only receive this forgiveness if we forgive one another. In other words, we are to live as citizens of this kingdom that we become a part of. That we forgive as God has forgiven us. That we forgive to the same degree that God forgave us. And so the Lord's Supper is a moment not only for us to remember the kingdom that Jesus established. It's not only a moment for us to remember how this kingdom provides us the forgiveness of sins, but it is a moment for us to realize and consider our relationships. Have I failed to forgive someone? 
We also ask the reverse of that question. Has someone failed to, forgiven, to forgive me? If we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled, forgive your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Jesus' point here is that worship or taking the Lord's Supper is secondary to our relationship with one another. This is a similar point that Paul makes to the Corinthians when he asks them, how can you take of the bread in the Lord's Supper, which is the body of Christ, when you are allowing your personal bodies to divide the body of Christ in the church. I want you to notice that Jesus begins by saying, when you are offering your gift at the altar. In other words, when you are worshiping. Jesus believes that worship, in the case of our study this morning, we're thinking specifically of the Lord's Supper, but our worship in general is a time to analyze our lives and relationships. How else would someone, when they're offering their gift, be remembering Going on in their relationship. I think it's because Jesus believes you're thinking about that as you're offering your gift and you're analyzing and you're thinking about your life and your relationships with people and you remember that there's this issue going on between you and a fellow brother or sister. Jesus believes that when we are worshiping or when we're taking the Lord's Supper, we're examining our lives and we can realize that there might be an unresolved issue that's going on. And Jesus says, you'll notice when this happens, that we immediately leave and we go and deal with it. Jesus says, you leave the altar, don't finish the sacrifice, you reconciled, you go forgive, and then you come back and you offer your gift. Which means that Jesus is placing reconciliation, forgiveness, specifically he's placing relationships and unity above anything else, including our worship, which is a crazy thing to think about because a lot of the times we do the opposite. We say, well, worship is number one, people are number two. Jesus here says, no, it's the opposite. People are one, you get that right. And then when you have some time left over, you can come, off, you can come and offer your gift at the altar. Now, I'm not sure this means that every time we gather to worship, we need to stop in the middle of, of church and go and solve every problem that's going on. I think this passage and, and some others might make some of us at time to, uh, from time to time, when there's something big going on, something major, something like the division that's going on in Corinth, we might decide to refrain from something like taking the Lord's Supper until we resolve this issue. But I think Paul, I think Jesus' point here is that he's exaggerating in order to make the point of how important reconciliation is. I don't think he's saying that every time there's an issue, you don't offer your gift and you don't deal with it because you might never actually offer the gift. I think he's doing this exaggerating to make the point and make sure it gets through our minds Reconciliation and relationships are more important than everything else. Even our worship of God. That God would rather us go and be reconciled with one another than to come, which again is sometimes the opposite. Sometimes when we have things going on in our relationships, rather than dealing with them, sometimes we're like, well, I'm going to come to church. Maybe make myself feel better. God says, no, stay home and deal with it. Deal with the relationship that's going on, and then we can come to worship. Now, this is an important point. You and I have a responsibility to bring about reconciliation. You'll notice that Jesus' point there is he says, when you're offering your gift and you realize that somebody has something against you, not that you need to forgive somebody else, but somebody else needs to forgive you. You've done something. Maybe you haven't even done anything, but somebody has something against you. Jesus says, you stop and you go deal with it. 
You and I have a responsibility not to just forgive, but to be people who seek to promote reconciliation in our lives and in the lives and relationships of others. However, what you and I can do only goes so far, right? And I think that's something important to remember. You can't force someone to be reconciled. Uh, we talked about that when we looked at uh, Philemon a uh, while back and cultivating a culture of reconciliation. That Paul places on Philemon the responsibility. He says, I'm not going to force you to do anything, but I'm kind of telling you what you have to do, or what you, not what you have to do, what you should do, and you remember you owe your life to me, so you kind of have to do it now. But Paul's like, I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to compel you. You can't compel someone to be reconciled. And so why we, while we have this responsibility, the lack of reconciliation, when we've done all that we can, is not something that we can allow to remain on our conscience, but hopefully something that we are still reminded of, I think, when we gather together to worship. It's something that we're praying about. It's something that we're hoping for. It's something that we're striving to find ways to bring about the reconciliation, though sometimes we max out our ability to reconcile, and we leave it in the hands of God. But how do we leave that in the hands of God? We leave it in the hands of God when we gather here to worship. Something that I believe very, very firmly is that when we gather together to worship, when we take the Lord's Supper, in particular, that it's not a time to clear our mind of, of worldly thoughts. I understand the good intentions of when we say that. I, I grew up, we gathered together, okay, now is that clear your mind of all thoughts. I'm not sure that's the point. I think the point, one of the points of worship is to fill our minds with worldly thoughts so we can lay them at the feet of Jesus. It's a moment for us to be reminded of what's going on outside this building, not a time to remind of everything else that's going on. And to bring that with us when we come to the cross, when we worship, and when we take the Lord's Supper, and lay it before Jesus and allow Him to work in it. You see, I think sometimes what happens when we leave everything out there and we come in here, that we separate my life from Jesus. Jesus works in here, I work out there, and they don't overlap. I think Jesus would say, let's bring this all together and allow him to work in what's going on out there as well as to work in here, which is how moments of worship and of the Lord's Supper are these moments that can remind us not just of the kingdom, not just of our forgiveness, not just of what Jesus has done for us, but what Jesus continues to do for us. The life that we are to continue to be living as the light of the world, as citizens in God's kingdom. And even in the moments where we've tapped out what we can do, which is often, we turn things over to the power of the Holy Spirit, to the cross of Christ, and allow Him to work in those relationships and in those spaces and places in our lives that we're having difficulty, we turn over to go back to how we began this morning, those wilderness moments, we allow ourselves to encounter Jesus in the midst of the wilderness. And it's these spaces and places where that kind of encounter takes place.